Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today we're going to look at Exodus chapter 14. Just as a reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word. So today we're going to read from Exodus chapter 14. And then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and theology My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes every day. So let's get to our reading today from Exodus 14. Exodus 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Haroth, between Megul and the sea in front of Bahul Zaphun. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servant servants was changed towards the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And so he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped them at the sea by Paharath in front of Balzifon. That's quite a mouthful, by the way. And when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians are marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that ye have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this that what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would be even better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near all the other night. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled into it. The Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. 
The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Well, this is our reading today from Exodus chapter 14. Now, the God who brought Israel out of Egypt is a great God. He always knows which way is best. He's always faithful to help us. He's always with us to guide us. And yet more than that, he is such a great God that he is able to work out everything for his own honor and glory. And this is the reason why God made the world in the beginning. And it's also why he's going to save us in the end. He is doing it so that in both creation and in salvation, he will get all the glory. And if that's true, that God's grand purpose in everything he does is to display his own glory, then it must be true of the Exodus, and it is. The theme of Exodus is saved for God's glory. And when God delivered Israel from Egypt, he did it in a way that guaranteed that he would receive all the honor and all the glory in Exodus 14, 1 through 4. Now, from the standpoint of military strategy, the due terror God told the Israelites to take was sheer Well, it was sheer lunacy. They were already well on their way to freedom when God ordered them to turn around, go back, camp between the desert and the sea. Now, the precise location of this is uncertain. The sea, of course, is the Red Sea, although some scholars have called it into question. Medigal means tower, so it was probably one of Egypt's forts. Most likely, Pi Harath was an opening in Egypt's canal system, while Bilal Zephron was named after one of the Canaanite gods. And beyond that, it's hard to be certain, and even though these places have long since been forgotten, it's obvious that they refer to real places located on a real map. If only we had an atlas of ancient Egypt, right? Well, wherever they were, the Israelites were completely vulnerable. They were out on Egypt's frontier, surrounded by desert, with their backs to the Red Sea. And why on earth would God put his people in this kind of position? We know that any military strategist, well worth his salt, would have recognized immediately they were trapped, which is exactly what God wanted Pharaoh to think. The whole thing was a ruse. God was tricking the Egyptians into thinking that the Israelites had no idea what they were doing. This would entice them to press what seemed to be their strategic advantage. But once Pharaoh attacked, his army would be utterly destroyed. And then it would be obvious to everyone that God had planned the whole thing. By putting his people between the desert and the sea, God would show both the Israelites and the Egyptians he was the Lord and that the glory of the victory belongs to him alone. God wanted to gain this glory at Pharaoh's expense. In fact, he says in verse 4 of our chapter, I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. Now, if this strategy seems familiar, it's because God used it again when he sent his son to the cross. To Satan, it must have seemed like Jesus had no idea what he was doing. He was God the Son, and yet he allowed himself to be handed over to sinful men who stripped him, beat him, crucified him. On the cross, he was so vulnerable that Satan thought he had the strategic advantage, and he pressed it to the death. But of course, that was Satan's fatal mistake, because the whole thing was a ruse. The cross was not a defeat for Jesus, but a victory. By making atonement, he was, he was to gain eternal victory over sin, death, and Satan. And so the Bible says that having disarmed the powers and authorities, he, Jesus, made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross in Colossians 2.15. Now, in order for God's brilliant strategy to work, Pharaoh had to pick up the chase. This takes us back to the palace, where Pharaoh was having another one of his infamous temper tantrums in Exodus 14.5. As soon as the Israelites left, Pharaoh realized he had lost more than most of his labor force. Now, who would complete his monuments? How would he ever complete his massive building projects? His cabinet officials were even more indignant Without the slaves to do all their work for them, they would have to fend for themselves. And as they discussed all this, the Egyptians decided that they really didn't want to let the Israelites go after all. And there was not a moment to lose, according to Exodus 14, 5 through 9. 
And now Pharaoh's change of heart shows that he never really repented of his sin. He had been given ever opportunity to set the captives free. Time after time, Moses had told him to let God's people go, and yet he refused. Then as the plague started to come, he began to negotiate, he began to bargain, and he began to bicker. He asked for prayer, even begging Moses to give him the blessing of God, but he never let go. And when finally he said that he would do what God wanted, he immediately changed his mind and went right back to his sins. Pharaoh's rebellion is a warning to anyone who never quite gets around to doing what God requires. What God wants is a total commitment to himself right here, right now, and for the rest of our lives. Now, Satan will not give up without a fight as the Israelites discover in Exodus 14.10. And what the Israelites saw was the world's most powerful army, supported by the world's most advanced military technology, the chariot. In order to capture his runaway slaves, Pharaoh, Pharaoh quickly mobilized his force and deployed his best battalion. They were in hot pursuit and riding on horseback. They came soon and very easily within easy striking distance. The Israelites here are in a dangerous and a desperate situation trapped between Pharaoh and the deep blue sea. But instead of looking to God in all of his grace and glory, they looked at their enemies and they were shaking in their boots. What makes this so disappointing is that they had witnessed God's wonders, the plagues, all 10 of them, not to mention the fact that they had escaped from Egypt only the night before. In fact, the scripture says that they marched out boldly in verse 8 of our chapter today, meaning confidently, even defiantly, and yet at the first sign of danger, they, they, were, they were afraid. They, they panicked. And this is another place where Israel's exodus is a picture of our own deliverance from captivity to sin. The Bible says that these things, meaning the events in the exodus, occurred as examples in 1 Corinthians 10, 6. This particular example shows what happens whenever God rescues his people from bondage. Satan tries to grab us before we can get away. Now, no sooner do we make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ than we face doubt and discouragement. Satan is riding furiously after us, tempting us to give up and turn back. Jesus taught us about this in the parable of the sower. He said that when some people hear the message of salvation in Matthew 13, 19, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. Others fall away when they suffer persecution or when they are worried by the troubles of life. It's a spiritual battle, and Satan never surrenders without a fight. And this isn't surprising because we were once his uh, valuable servants, and we would like nothing better than to have us back under his employment. Like a slaveholder coming north to hunt for a runaway slave, Satan wants to drag us back to the plantation of sin. But there is no fugitive slave law in the kingdom of God. You see, once God has set us free, Satan has no right to take us back. So what should we do when he's chasing after us? Well, not what the Israelites did in verse 10, which says they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Now, true, the Israelites did cry out to God and elsewhere scripture seems to make this a very positive thing like in Joshua 24, 6 through 7 and Nehemiah 9, 9. And yet this was not a pure cry of faith. It was a fearful cry of desperation. The Israelites did not really believe that God would save them, but fully expected to be destroyed. Now, the proof is that rather than waiting for the Lord to answer, the Israelites immediately turned on his prophet. People often do this when they're under spiritual attack. They, they blame their spiritual leaders. This is a case and what the Israelites said to Moses in verse 11 of our chapter. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? And thus began a long tradition of Jewish comedy. What gave their sarcasm its bite, of course, was that there were graves all over Egypt, like the Great Pyramids, to just give one example. And they said to Moses in verses 11 through 12 of our chapter, What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? In other words, we told you so. And maybe the Israelites did tell Moses to leave them alone, but if they did... Scripture doesn't tell us. Probably they were just sulking the way people usually do when things don't go their way. And what was most alarming about all of their willingness to go right back into their bondage, they told Moses in verse 12, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. 
Now, the whole point of the Exodus was for them to serve the Lord. But here they were. They were, they were wanting to go right back and serve Pharaoh. This was more than a loss of nerve. It was a lack of faith. By pledging their allegiance to Pharaoh, they were denying the power of God. When he says in Psalm 106, 7, they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. And, and we are often tempted, let's be honest, to do the same thing that the Israelites are doing. God wants to bring us all the way out of our sins. Our problem is that we only want to come part way. We decide to follow Christ. But as soon as we start having problems, we get scared and go right back to our old ways of coping. Anger, enslavement to our various passions, depression, distraction. And no matter how much we hate it, there was security in the way we used to live. So if we return to the same old harmful relationships and friendships and patterns, the same old attitudes and the same old nasty habits. And yet we must emphasize there is a way of escape. Consider that the Israelites were never in any real danger. Even though Pharaoh was coming after them, they were right where the Lord wanted him and he would rescue them in his timing. What was at stake was not simply their lives, but the honor and glory of God, which he would protect at any cost. And so what the Israelites should have done was remember what kind of God they served, a God who already knows the best way. He was always faithful to help his people, and he always stays with them to guide them. And more than that, they should have remembered his purpose to work out everything according to his plan. We see Moses did remember all this, and that is exactly why he knew what to do when he was caught between the desert and the sea in Exodus 14, 13 through 14. And with these words, Moses issued three commands. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. Be still. Do not be afraid is what Gamarians call a negative imperative. It is the strongest possible form of expressing negation in the Hebrew language. And so when Moses told the Israelites not to be afraid, he he was not comforting them. He was rebuking them. He was telling them they had no right to be afraid because they had no reason to fear. All they needed what to do was to stand their ground, quietly waiting to see what the Lord and his sovereign power would do. Now, in many military situations like this, this would not be good advice, but what made it work in this case was that the Israelites had someone to do all the fighting for them. The Lord was with them to save them. He was their warrior, and so all they needed to do was to stand and see their salvation. In this battle, they were not soldiers. They were only spectators. The same holds true for our salvation in Christ. Satan is pursuing us, but instead of running away, all we need to do is stand and see the salvation of our God. Christianity is not about something that we can do to become better people. It is about what Christ has done through his cross and through the empty tomb and through his resurrection. Jesus Christ has accomplished everything necessary for our salvation. He is the one who has atoned for our sin, who has turned aside the wrath of God, who offers perfect righteousness as the gift of faith, and who has gained entrance into resurrection life. And so when people ask, what do we have to do to be saved? The answer is, we don't have to do anything. Jesus has already done it. We need to look to him for our salvation. And once we put our faith in Jesus, we need to stand our ground. We are in a spiritual battle. And in that battle, the Bible gives us the same marching orders that Moses gave to Israel in Ephesians 6.13. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. And so in our struggle with Satan, we need to take our stand with Jesus, waiting for God to deliver us. Now, it's hard to be still and wait for God. Our temptation is to run away, to cry out in fear, or to fix everything on our own. Instead, God orders us to stand our ground. The Lord is our defender, our champion. And so when we're caught between the desert and the sea, all we need to do is to be still and look for his salvation. All good stories have a climax, but the book of Exodus is such a great adventure that it has not only one, but three. The first climax is Israel crossing the Red Sea in chapter 14. The second is God giving his law at Mount Sinai in chapters 19 and following. And the third is the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle at the end of chapter 40. The first of these climatic moments may be the most famous event in all of the Old Testament. Anyone who knows anything about the Bible knows that the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea. And given all this attention, it isn't surprising that over the centuries, a certain amount of misinformation has crept in about exactly what happened when Moses led God's people through the, Red, through the sea. This makes it all the more important to get the story straight. 
And one way to do this is to approach Exodus 14 as a journalist, asking questions about the text. So who? It's an easy question. The people who crossed the Red Sea were the Israelites. They were the people whom God had chosen to save, led by the prophet Moses. The people who were lost at the sea were the Egyptians. For hundreds of years, Pharaoh had kept uh, God's people enslaved, but the miracle by the sea brought his bitter tyranny to an end. This was a final showdown in the battle between Israel's Lord and the gods of Egypt. The what? It's also well known. The Red Sea was parted, and the Israelites walked through on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, riding on their chariots, the sea collapsed and the army drowned. It was such a crushing defeat that Egypt did not threaten Israel again until sometime after the death of Solomon. And yet the Bible describes it all very matter-of-factly in Exodus 14:21 through 23 and Exodus 14:27 through 29. Well, when did it happen? Right at the time when everything seemed to be lost, when the Israelites were trapped between Pharaoh and the deep blue sea. God had told his people to reverse directions and make their camp by the sea. Well, we know this was a terrible position, at least from a standpoint of military strategy, but it was all port, part of God's master plan for destroying Pharaoh. Even so, the Israelites understandably were terrified when they looked up and saw the Egyptians rushing after them in headlong pursuit. Now in desperation, they cried out to God and to his prophet, and they were caught between an unconquerable army and an impassable sea. Now it was just then that God saved his people, right when it was obvious that there was nothing they could do to save themselves. First, Moses told the Israelites not to be afraid, and rather than encouraging them to stand and fight, he told them to stand and to wait to see what God would do. Now, once the prophet delivered this message in verse 15, uh, he says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Well, this is, verse is very puzzling because in it, God seems to give his prophet a reprimand. The word you occurs in the singular, thereby referring to Moses. And yet Moses was hardly the one who needed to be rebuked. The Israelites were the ones who cried out in fear, not Moses, who for his part believed that God would deliver his people. So why did God rebuke him? Well, probably the best way to understand this is to recognize that as Israel's prophet, Moses represented the people before God. He was the mediator in the covenant. The rebuke that God gave him, therefore, was really meant for all of Israel. The hour of their salvation had come. This was no time for crying and complaining. It was time for moving on. Now, when Charles Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers, preached on this passage, he said, Far be it from me to ever to say a word in disparagement of the holy, happy, heavenly exercise of prayer. But, beloved, there are times when prayer is not enough, when prayer itself is out of season. When we have prayed over a matter to a certain degree, it then becomes sinful to tarry any longer. Our plain duty is to carry out our desires into action. And having asked God for God's guidance, and having received divine power from on high, to go at once to our duty without any longer deliberation or delay. Now it was time for God's people to get up and get going. However, humanly speaking, what God told them to do was impossible. There was no way for them to move forward. It was the darkest hour before dawn and they were up against the sea. But of course, with God, all things are possible, even things that are impossible for mere human beings. This is especially the case in our salvation. The constant message of scripture is that we cannot save ourselves. Only God can save us. And so when did the Israelites cross the sea? At a time when only God could open the way to salvation. Today, every sinner is in the same situation. There is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. Until God's spirit changes our minds and our hearts, we will never come to Christ. Nevertheless, God commands us to repent and believe. And if that seems possible, the thing to do is to cry out to God for mercy, and he's going to save us. Now, we may never know precisely where the exodus took place, but we know how the how because the Bible tells us, to begin with, there was a mighty wind. A strong east wind blew all the night, and by morning the sea had turned to dry land in verse 21. Moses' actions are mentioned four times. Twice God told them what to do, and twice he did it. God told them in, in Exodus 14, 16, and 21 to raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And again, he says what to do in verses 26 through 27 of Exodus 14. And so Israel crossed the Red Sea by the power of Moses and his mighty staff. 
And yet, this explanation does not go far enough. There was wind, yes, and the strong arm of the prophet, but what brought Israel out of Egypt was the power of God. In fact, the whole chapter is full of divine activity. God was the one who told Moses to raise his staff who hardened the hearts of the Egyptians, so they chased after the Israelites, who protected the Israelites all night when they were between the desert and the sea. The scripture describes how the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front of them and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the clouds brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. In verses 19 to 20 of our chapter. And as we've seen, the pillar of cloud and fire was a theophany, a visible appearance of the invisible God. Here, the cloud is identified as the angel of God in verse 19, which is the messenger of God. Somewhere, the, the great uh, Puritan theologian John Owen explained that the person who went behind the Israelites to protect them was the angel of the covenant, the great angel of the presence of God, in whom was the name and the nature of God. However, back in Exodus 13, 21, the cloud was simply identified as the Lord. And in Exodus 14, 24, it says that the Lord looked down from the cloud. So to summarize, God himself was the glorious cloud, but the cloud was also his messenger. Moses experienced something similar back at the burning bush. And what appeared to him was the angel of the Lord in Exodus 3, 2. But the one who spoke to him was none other than God himself. Now, to make a sense of all this, some Christians conclude that the person both in the bush and in the cloud was the pre-incarnate son of God. God the Son is the very God of very God. He is also God's messenger of salvation. So perhaps the glorious cloud represented the second person of the Trinity. Well, whether that's right or not, God was certainly present with his people to protect them. And when the prophet Isaiah looked back on this event he wrote the angel of his presence saved them in Isaiah 63 9 the cloud was their guard as well as their guide it moved behind the Israelites to shield them from their enemies the Egyptians were uh, chomping at the bit ready to attack but all night long God kept them in the dark meanwhile on the other side of this divine blockade the children of God were in the light this is what distinguishes God's people from the world we are in the light and God is always right where we need him to keep us safe God was doing something that night. He was parting the waters, visually reversing creation by turning the sea back into dry land. And then once his enemies had fallen into his trap and were stuck in the quagmire, God made the sea return and swept the Egyptians to their watery grave. He planned and even executed the entire exodus. Isaiah asked in Isaiah 51, 10, was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over it. You see, God was so involved that even the Egyptians knew he was there fighting against them, as it says in Exodus 14, 24, and 25. Now, by this point, the wheels really are starting to come off. First, God threw the Egyptians into a panic, possibly by sending a violent storm from this cloud in uh, Psalm 77, 17 through 18. And then Pharaoh's chariots got bogged down in the mud. And the more they struggled, the more they got stuck. And by the time they said, let's get out of here, it was too late. And the Egyptians knew exactly who had derailed them. God had promised that that one day they would know who the Lord was. And that promise came true because when they finally went down to destruction, they went with God's name on their lips. The Bible sums it up, this up in Exodus 14, 30 saying that day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians laying dead on the shore. How did the Israelites escape from Egypt? It it, it was not just the wind and the tide. It was not simply poor strategy on the part of Pharaoh or an unexpected failure of military technology. It was not merely a sudden storm over the water. It was the power of God. He was the one who brought Israel out of Egypt. Well, God used the wind to drive back the sea. This simply shows that he is able to use creation in the service of redemption. He also employed a human instrument. By faith, Moses was able to perform the prophetic sign that accompanied salvation. And scripture brings these three elements together, the natural, the human, and the divine. And and this is the point of verse 21 of our chapter today. This is one of the mysteries of God's sovereignty. He is able to use the world that he made and even sinful human beings to accomplish a saving purpose.
So no matter how one looks at it, crossing the Red Sea was a miracle. Donald Bridge tells the story of a liberal minister preaching in an old Bible-believing African-American church. At certain points in his sermon, the minister referred to the crossing of the Red Sea. Praise the Lord, someone shouted, taking all them children through the deep waters. What a mighty miracle. However, the minister did not happen to believe in miracles, and so he said, rather condescendingly, it was not a miracle. They were in marshland. The tide was ebbing, and the children of Israel picked their way across in six inches of water. Praise the Lord, the man shouted again, drowning all them Egyptians in six, six inches of water. What a mighty miracle. Indeed, it was a miracle. How did the Israelites make their great escape? By the hand of God who saved them from the hand of their enemies, according to verses 30 through 31 of our chapter today. The Exodus had had to come by God's hand in order for it to fulfill its divine intention. Well, the answer is very simple, an answer that explains the whole Exodus. Indeed, it is the answer that explains why God does everything he's ever done, is doing right now, or ever will do. The answer is the glory of God. He did it for his own glory. God announced his intention to glorify himself before the Israelites even reached the Red Sea. He says that in verse 4 of our chapter. God accomplished this glorious purpose in two ways. One, by judging the Egyptians for their sins, as he does in verses 17 through 18. This was all part of God's strategy. He lured the Egyptians into chasing Moses all across the desert, and when they finally caught up, it was right at the spot where God planned for them to meet their watery doom. There were no survivors, according to Psalm 106.11. A rushing wave swept over them, and the next thing anybody knows, their bodies were washing up on the seashore. And God was glory. Now, some might think that was harsh for God to drown an entire army, but it was right, and it was just. Pharaoh and his soldiers were cruel, cruel to them, bent on destroying the people of God. Was it not right for God to punish evil men for killing innocent children? It was especially appropriate for them to die by drowning because they had once tried to drown the children of Israel in the Nile. What happened to them at the Red Sea was divine retribution. These men deserve to be punished for their sins. And God is glorified when he judges his people for their sin because this displays his divine attribute of justice. And God was also judging Egypt's gods, and this too was for the glory of God. It is ironic that the Egyptians were defeated at daybreak because that is when uh, their sun god was supposedly rising in the east. But Ra could not save them, nor could Pharaoh save them, even though he too was revered as a god. Now, according to one ancient inscription, he whom the king has loved will be a revered one, but there is no tomb for a rebel against his majesty, and his corpse is cast into water. Now, this inscription was a threat to drown Pharaoh's enemies, but in the end, the Egyptians were the ones who were lost at sea, and God did this for the praise of his justice. Well, something similar is going to happen at the final judgment. Evil men will be destroyed and God will be glorified. Revelation 21 tells of how the city of Satan will be cast into the sea. This will be for the honor and glory of God because immediately afterward, the saints will sing a hallelujah chorus in Revelation 19, 1 and 2. God deserves our praise because he will do justice in the end. And God was doing something more than judging the Egyptians. He was also saving the Israelites and this too was for his glory. What could be more glorious than God saving his people by bringing him through the sea? This was one of the most amazing things God has ever done, and people are still talking about it today. As Nehemiah said in one of his prayers in Nehemiah 9.10, you made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. The crossing of the Red Sea brought glory to God by convincing the Israelites to believe in God, which may have been the greatest miracle of all. And so the Israelites must have had some faith already because they were willing to at least to follow God between the two great walls of water. In fact, Hebrews 11.29 says, By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on a dry land. But they made an even firmer faith commitment when it was all over. Exodus 14 ends on this triumphant note in verse 31. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. God was fulfilling his grand purpose of saving his people for his glory. For that to happen, his people had to trust him and worship him. Notice the order here. God did not wait for his people to trust in him before he would save them. If he had waited for that to happen, they would never have been saved. Instead, God took the initiative. First, the people saw their salvation, just as Moses had promised in Exodus 14, 13. And then they feared and believed. 
This is the pattern and the purpose of salvation. First, God delivers us from danger, saving us when we cannot save ourselves. And then we respond in faith, trusting God and worshiping God. As Christians, Israel's escape is part of the history of our own salvation. However, we have experienced an even greater escape, the greatest escape of all. We have been saved from our bondage to sin through the death and resurrection of Christ. Here again, we see the order of salvation in which God takes the initiative. It is while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. God's saving work comes first, and then we are called to respond in faith. Now it's noteworthy that the New Testament describes Christ's saving work in terms of the exodus. Not long after Jesus was born, his parents fled to Egypt. According to the Gospel of Matthew, their eventual return fulfilled the words of the prophet in Matthew 2.15, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Originally, this prophecy referred to the exodus. In fact, there is a deep spiritual connection between what happened to Israel under Moses and what happened later in the person and work of Christ. Jesus is the perfect and ultimate Israel. And one of the ways God showed this was by having Jesus recapitulate Israel's escape from Egypt. Later, as the crucifixion drew near, Jesus described his death as an exodus in Luke 9.31. He was making another connection. Jesus is the new Moses worthy of greater honor, according to Hebrews 3.3 who leads God's people out of their bondage to sin and into the promised land of eternal life. The most significant connection in the present context is the one that the Apostle Paul made when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Paul was making a connection between the Exodus and baptism. For the Israelites passing through the Red Sea was a type of baptism, and thus it was a four cast of our final deliverance in Christ. Once we were enslaved in the Egypt of sin, but now Christ has set us free. All this is symbolized in the Red Sea event of baptism. At this point, some uh, preachers would invite their congregations to identify their own Red Sea experience and to trust God to bring them through. One thinks of a scholar who wrote, Every age has its Egypt, its force of oppression, just as every age has its children of Israel who long to be free. Now, this misses the point. Israel's passage to the Red Sea is not primarily intended to teach us what to do when we're in spiritual trouble any more than it serves as a how-to lesson than what to do when we come to a large body of water. Rather, it is meant to teach us about about coming to God for salvation. What happened at the Red Sea ought to help us clarify our relationship in Christ. The only Red Sea experience that really matters is the one that Jesus had when he passed through the walls of death and came out victorious on the other side. This means that baptized Christians have already had their Exodus experience. We had it at Calvary and in the garden tomb because Jesus died and rose again. He did it for us. And we were included in the saving events when we were baptized into him and are now safe on the other side. All that remains for us to do is what the Israelites did. Fear God and trust him and move forward. Sadly, those who have not yet come to Christ are still standing on the shores of the Red Sea. How how are they ever going to escape? Only by looking to Jesus. And when the Israelites saw what God had done for them, they put all their trust and hope in him. God has called us to do the same thing. He calls us to see Jesus Christ crucified and risen and to believe in him. Jesus says in John 5, 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believe has crossed over from death to life. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and we've looked at Exodus 14. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.